Okay, so we're back and we're going to take a look now at the proximity sensor node and how we can use that to detect where a user's viewing location is. Okay, so here's the summary for uh, proximity sensor node. What it does is it tracks where the position and where the orientation of the user's viewpoint is but it doesn't necessarily do it everywhere, it just does it within the confines of a bounding box that can be as small or as large as the volume where we want to track the user. Okay, so when we define that box, it's not drawn, it's not visibly rendered. But it is affected by all of the parent transformations in the scene graph, so if we have any transforms above it, those will each reposition, each rotate the bounding box for the proximity sensor. Okay. Now, given that you have this sensor in the, in the scene and that it's enabled, then what does it give you? We have several output events. We have position changed, we have orientation changed. Those are the obvious and the most uh, important ones that we use. But we also have a center of rotation changed. In case the user is in examine mode, where you click and drag and it rotates the scene, then if they re-click someplace else to drag someplace else, this will tell them if the center of rotation has, to, has been modified. Okay. Now the fields on this guy are uh, uh, pretty much all what we might expect to see from the concepts in this chapter. Uh, the center of the box, the size of the box, whether it's enabled, whether it's active and uh, as an output event and uh, the time that they entered or exited the field. Okay, so as with most of our sensors, where would you put this in an animation chain? Ah, as a trigger node. Put it right at the beginning so that if the scene detects this equation of the user entering or the user exiting a box, you can go, oh, he's proximate enough. I want to do something, that's my trigger. You could also use it simply as a source. The position data or the rotation data might be fed to a script, might be fed to a heads-up display, something like that. So let's take a look further. <clears throat> All right, so here are our primary output events of interest uh, that are unique to proximity sensor. And uh, there's the position changed. And so that position is relative to the center of the and wherever that center is in uh, local coordinate space. And uh, that can be constructed any way you'd like to have it. And it's, not, it's actually pretty nice having it in the local coordinate frame because that means you can reposition it. And let's say you have something going on in a certain area. You can make everything work relatively and it'll hang together. And then if you move that whole thing over to another place, it still works because the coordinates are relative from one thing to another. However, we also often find that you might prefer to just have one proximity sensor and keep that one proximity sensor right at the center of the entire world, wherever that may be, so that you get actual coordinates. Not relative, but actual coordinates of wherever the camera might be at a given moment. Okay, orientation changed is our second output event, and that tells us if we've rotated with respect to the current uh, coordinate system. Now, if our parent transforms have only translated our bounding box, our, our proximity box, then the rotation changed from this perspective is the same as the rotation changed from the origin of the world's perspective. But if there was any kind of rotation in there, it'll be relative, relative to the other one. Okay, and then the center of rotation change is definitely a uh, advanced capability, and that's uh, if you're uh, tracking the fine details of how users interacting with uh, during the navigation info, navigation mode. So we might see this if somebody was writing, say, a new. Uh, uh, navigation paradigm, wanted to improve on center of rotation, or 
perhaps be smarter about where has the user uh, shifted my center of rotation to. Maybe I want to do some other thing like highlight the object differently or call up something else. Okay, so here you see proximity sensor superimposed has a triggering node in an animation shape. Okay? And frankly, this one's pretty practical because uh, often we are either setting up to have an animation repeat indefinitely or else have the animation wait until the user gets close and then they select it with their selection device. Uh, the drawbacks of each is if it's repeating indefinitely, then when the user finally does get around to seeing the animation of interest, it might be in the middle of, of the animation instead of the beginning where it makes sense. The disadvantage of triggering, needing a selection for a proximity sensor is just that. It forces the user to trigger and uh, commence it and they may not know, they may not bother, they might not have noticed what's going on. Okay. Uh, it's also a little more elegant when the program itself seems to figure it out and the user's gone here, it's gone there, the user's now here. Under the hood, the scene is saying, oh, proximity is close enough. From the user's perspective, oh, look, something's happening now. My scene is reacting to my presence. Very interactive. Okay, so we can embed interactivity into our scenes and prompt further interactions with the user. Okay. Further uh, benefits of this, it's not just when you turn it on that matters, but also when you turn it off. Okay, uh, If you turn it off, uh, that can save computer cycles. There's less animation. There's less geometry getting recomputed. There's less state getting updated. And it's not all wasted because it's happening somewhere off screen where the user can't even see it. Okay. Uh, that might not even be noticeable on the kinds of scenes we're building right here, but as we start adding more and more worlds together and building very big worlds, uh, cyberspace, if you will, uh, this is an important technique to make sure stuff isn't uh, chewing up our bandwidth, chewing up our cycles in the back background. Rather, it keeps it very efficient even though it gets very large. Okay. So we have a couple of examples here. Uh, um, each one is shown uh, with a single bounding box or uh, multiple bounding boxes. And uh, you may recall from our warnings before that uh, overlapping, I, excuse me, I'm mistyping here. Recall from before that we don't want to overlap. Okay, so rather than give you an example that overlaps and uh, uh, exercises how did it work out wrongly, which is kind of a nonsensical question, we gave you one with multiple different non overlapping instances. Okay, so we have uh, four and four different uh, proximity sensors in the second example. Then multiple non-overlapping use. The difference here in the third scene is that we've got a proximity sensor there, a use copy of it there, a use copy of it there, and a use copy of it there. So uh, we can now examine how these guys work. Okay, now that is not the example. That's a different example. So. So Jeff, we're going to have to um, pause the recording right there uh, and splice it. My X3D edit never did launch, so let's try again.
So I'm going to go through these couple of examples and that'll be it for today. We're just going to do the one note. Because Wednesday you have your next session next, right? And I think we will find you will find Matt's white head going right in front of the camera. <laughs> I'll put in a little map there. <laughs> he thought he thought we were supposed to do recording today and it's tomorrow. He just got a bunch of surgery done to his mouth too, so he's probably a little out of it. That was why. Yeah, when you put the, together the blooper reel, be sure to have about uh, 99 seconds of doors slamming and opening and slamming again and slamming again. <laughs> so hey, anyone in there? there? And slamming again. <laughs> the best is the soda can. You can only, I don't know what it is yeah. about soda cans, but you can hear them opening up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, guys, on the examples I'm going to show today, um, I did make some changes just this morning. I added some viewpoints to them, so uh, I'll rerun the build tonight. So you won't find, you'll find the same basic scene, and you'll be able to navigate in yourself if you do it, but uh, you may not find that. Uh, Oh, cool, that worked. How about that? all set up but it did not survive the shutdown this go to sleep crossing campus so Jeff, stand by, here it comes. Okay, so here it is. We have uh, the scene proximity sensor single. And oh, I guess we have, oh, we have uh, Dilbert here. We better check that. Wally's saying, some people see me as a loser who achieves nothing. Of course, you notice the straight face. Wally says all that as a statement of fact. In reality, though, he's a winner, knows how to set realistic goals. Gilbert's reply, so you're a sort of a genius, since we all have trouble with goals. Well, yes, and even though his only goal was to have a pulse. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's always good to set good expectations in our work. Uh, maybe we can go a little higher than that. Uh, here we have our scene, proximity sensor single. And let's see if we can restart our browser. We see it right there. And... Uh, in here we see that our navigation info is a walk. Let's open this up a little bit. Uh, there's our proximity sensor, and it's right next to a box outline. 
<coughs> don't let this uh, index line set fool you. It's uh, it's a box. You can look at all the coordinates and see that they go ones to negative ones. So we built a box the hard way as an indexed line set, and then added another box, a default box that had some uh, transparency to it and also a little color. So we see an outlined box is this construct right here. And then right next to it, with the same exact size as both the wireframe box and the actual box is our proximity sensor. All right, now added to this scene up near the top is a viewpoint for uh, getting us inside the proximity box so that we can see some of the results. And what's done with this is the position changed and the orientation changed are each routed. They're routed down to our script. And uh, there's the name of the proximity sensor. And there's the name of the uh, output. Let's do it this way. Our proximity sensor is here I am. It's output. We're going to do orientation change. And we're going to send that to our script, which is called location report. So we have uh, two routes, one each for um, the orientation and for the position. If we look at this script, say, what the heck is the script doing? Well, there are the two inputs for it. Position and orientation are input only, so our values get routed into those fields, and then they're passed off to the script. And where the script is not is there. It's not an embedded script in C data, but rather is provided externally. And it's provided externally as uh, both a local script and an online script. So let's click on that. And uh, we can take advantage of our little editor here if we uh, slide things around and expose it. Yep, sure enough, just like with the URL, uh, with the field definitions, we've got buttons here. So I can select either script. Let's select the top local one. And uh, let's load it into X3D Edit. OK, load. OK. And sure enough, there's our script right there receiving the values. So what happens when they get those values? OK, position gets a position value. And then what is it doing? Well, it's using array access to uh, first get the value. Then it takes advantage of uh, a JavaScript function set digits to say uh, only go to uh, two decimal places past there. Um, now, same thing happens for orientation. The value comes in. We compute x, y, z, and r, namely just breaking down that SF rotation array. And uh, then we print it out in each case. Print, print. All right. Uh, what's left? Oh, there's our function, our magic function set digits. We didn't get that for free from ECMAScript. We actually had to write it. Uh, in this case, Len Daly wrote it. And very nice script. It takes uh, first is the value, and then P is the precision. You multiply it together. You add 0.5 to round off. You divide by that precision, and uh, you return the rounded off math.4 value. OK, so uh, pretty terse, but pretty effective. That should work. So let's look at this guy now. Let me get back to the right one here. Proximity sensor single. There we are. And now we can walk our way in, or we can select the viewpoint that's inside. So we're now inside the box. Let me do that again. Well, this time I'll just walk my way in. Once we go inside the box, the color will change, okay, because uh, the box wasn't two sided. 
And so now that we're inside, we can rotate around, and you can see when we do that, you can see the sides of the box travel by. If we pull up the console, we should see down there, oh, I clobbered it. Let's launch it externally. Uh, we could launch it externally, and uh, so far I've tested this scene in XJ3D and in uh, instant reality, and it worked in both. Here we go. We'll go to the uh, inner viewpoint. We'll open up the console. And let's try again. There we go. We zoomed in. And you can see as soon as we zoomed inside the box, this started printing out the console here. You can ignore all the rest of the stuff. Uh, Instant Player is a pretty verbose still on its diagnostics. But as I continue moving around inside there, you can see the slide bar zoom up, and we just keep adding more and more values. Okay, so that's a way to figure out what's going on. Let's uh, look at the one where we have multiple boxes, see if this will work for us. Go inside one of them. No joy, I'll launch it externally. Launch it in XJ3D this, this time. And what I'll be doing is uh, going through each of the boxes and while inside, we'll rotate and see if we can't get the console to output a value. Okay, so here's our console. Here's our scene. <coughs> we'll test the base case first, which is outside any of these proximity sensors. And you can see while we're outside, there are no values coming up in the script. If we navigate our way inside, you see, oh, we got a few values. Let me rotate a little more. And once again, we have values appearing. If we go to proximity box two, Again, you see values appearing. Proximity box three, again, values appearing. And then we go back out again, and should be done. I'll clear all that. Rotate, nothing happening. OK, so I think we have that example set. The third one is just a variation on the same theme does the same thing. So let's get back to the slides and what's left for this node. If we look at the final example, uh, proximity sensor, it, it does the same thing, but this time it routes those values not to just a script node, but to a text field, and we'll see it as a billboard. So that's where we'll pick up next time, and uh, then we'll continue on with the uh, visibility sensor. See you there.